My name is Magdalena Ackerman. Um, I will be co-moderating the webinar today together with uh, Manoj uh, Kurian here from the World Council of Churches. Uh, and I am part of the civil society and indigenous peoples mechanism. Today I'm connecting from Sao Paulo, Brazil. So uh, thank you so much. And uh, I leave the floor now to Manoj. Manoj, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Magdalena. Uh, Manoj Kurian, uh, the coordinator of the WCC Ecumenical Advocacy Alliance, and uh, uh, really a privilege uh, for us to be working uh, with the CSIPM. The online webinar, uh, just to give you the objectives of the webinar, that it will achieve to update, hope to achieve the update, the constituency on the latest status of the food crisis and the need for policy response at local, uh, national and, and global levels. Um, we, we also would like to uh, share uh, and receive and share the work of civil society, indigenous people and faith communities in this situation, uh, lifting up the resilience, the challenges, uh, we face and the innovations and successes that we are experiencing. Um, also, we hope that uh, you know this will lead to us to articulate key demands towards uh, policymakers uh, and the UN systems, in particular, uh, and demanding a globally coordinated response um, uh, in this in this challenge. Um, we will continue the briefing. We'll also continue assisting. Uh, continuing to monitor the food insecurity at the community level, to channel the information to various con constituencies and the UN, and to inform and conscientize the communities on the challenges and possible solutions. Now we hope that you know we can. It'll bring us together, faith communities, closely working with civil society, which have we have been going, but we need to strengthen and deepen this relationship to facilitate advocacy for policy change at the leadership level from the country level upwards. Um, and uh, we just, uh, let's go straight into uh, the webinar. We you know initially we'll have a part of uh, welcoming and a key uh, introduction into a global perspective. Then we go into the other parts where we have specific input from the regions followed by uh, uh, discussions. So. Let's dive straight into the into the program. Uh, we have first we have welcoming words from Reverend Dr. Kenneth Matata. He's the uh, director of public witness and diaconia, uh, and the um, from the World Council of Churches. He's an educator, a religious leader from Zimbabwe, and uh, he is an authority in biblical teaching, uh, interpretation, analysis, and also in organizational development. And until recently, he was leading the Zimbabwe Council of Churches as its general secretary. Welcome, uh, Kenneth. Over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Manoj. Uh, brothers and sisters, I also want uh, to welcome you uh, from the World, C World Council of uh, Churches, uh, Civil Society, and the Indigenous uh, Peoples Mechanism for Relations uh, with the United Nations Committee on Food, uh, World uh, Food Security. I welcome you to this uh, uh, conversation uh, where we are going to share updates uh, in discussions on uh, food uh, crisis and uh, responses. I thank each one of you uh, for taking your precious time to participate, uh, to contribute, to learn uh, for this, uh, impo from this important encounter. Over the past uh, three years, uh, we have seen compounded uh, uh, challenges uh, resulting from climate uh, emergency, uh, conflicts, uh, wars, uh, and uh, of course, uh, from uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, the most vulnerable communities have been battered, uh, increasing inequality, uh, poverty, and hunger globally. For the first time in, 20, in the 21st century, uh, global poverty has uh, increased. An estimated 77 million people were living in extreme poverty in 2021 compared uh, with uh, 2019. Uh, and uh, as uh, 8, 22 million people go to bed hungry every day today, the number of those who are facing acute foods insecurity is almost tripled from 135 million to 345 million since 2019. 
the current food system uh, reveals sy systemic failures leading to 3.1 billion people, nearly 40% of the world population being unable to afford healthy diet each day. This crisis has been in the making for a long time and begs for fundamental shifts in the way we manage the world's resources. We will listen uh, to inputs uh, today, the voices from the different regions of the world regarding this alarming reality and discussions will follow to prepare us for, uh, for the reminder uh, for the uh, uh, remainder of the 50 plenary session of the Committee on World Food Security reconvening in Rome uh, on uh, December 19. It will also help us to find sustainable and lasting solutions. But from a faith uh, perspective, uh, where we come from uh, as members of the WCC and many others who are joining uh, with us uh, today, we recognize some important tenets. First, that all people are created in the image of God, as we read from scriptures, and that all people are created with worthy and need care and protection. We also remember from the New Testament readings that our Lord Jesus Christ says that he came so that people can have life and that they can have it in abundance. All are entitled to experience love, the love of God and the love of one another, not to be hindered by circumstances or their situations in life. In the public domain, experiencing love translate experiencing justice and peace in our lives every day. But we are not entitled to exploit each other or the planet to amass resources and wealth at the expense of others. So we read from our writings, from the holy writings. Groups of people are not entitled to benefit from global chaos, misery of the majority, and superficial analysis and half-baked solutions. Based on these values that we share, not only, not only as people of faith, but also together with all other people of goodwill, we make the following commitments. First, that we mobilize locally, nationally, and internationally to provide food and livelihood support to those who are in need. That we get involved in advocacy to lift the voices and the experiences of most marginalized, marginalized communities, those who are challenged with injustices, and to provide positive examples and solutions. Number three, we seek to address the situation holistically by addressing the root causes of the problems and challenging the existing superficial analysis uh, and solutions. Fourth, we emphasize the role of indigenous people as custodians of land and care as they address the challenges that affect them, but also in solidarity with one another. Hence, we are privileged to stand alongside CSIPM, the most significant international space for civil society organizations based on the 11 constituencies working to eradicate food insecurity and malnutrition. It is also vital that we have the leadership of the constituencies and working groups of CSIPM and the core lead of the UN Global Crisis Response Group with us to update us on the situation, both from a global and regional context. With our shared vision for justice, peace, and fulfilling and sustainable livelihoods for all, faith communities and civil society must stand, walk, and work together to achieve and sustain positive transformation. We need to transform food uh, systems through agroecology, ensuring food sovereignty and promoting local food systems, limiting corporate power and transform trade rules, which are part, this is part of our shared uh, agenda. In our journey forward, let us hold the powerful and ourselves accountable 
and ensure the dignity and the rights of individuals and people's groups are protected and promoted. Assuring this process full and uh, energetic support uh, from the WCC uh, and our global constituency, I uh, wish you all uh, uh, in successful discussion uh, this, uh, uh, this afternoon uh, on our part, but maybe in the morning in other parts uh, of the world. And we look forward to fruitful conversations. Uh, thank you. Uh, back to you, Manoj. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Reverend Dr. Kenneth uh, Tata, for those uh, inspiring words. And uh, and we, we we look forward to this session uh, in anticipation and and and, and prepared. Uh, now we go into the interfaith prayer, uh, where we um, uh, invite Reverend Dr. Angelique Walker Smith. Uh, she is. A WCC, World Council of Churches President from North America. She's an ordained minister and a senior associate at Bread for the World in Washington, D.C. She works nationally and internationally to combat hunger and is a dynamic advocate for the right to food. Over to you, Angelique. Welcome. And thank you so much, Dr. Minaj, and to all that are present. It is indeed an honor to be here to accompany our brothers and sisters in the Indigenous community. Thank you so much. Our prayer comes from Geraldo Oberman in Argentina and Presbyterian Mission Liturgy in 2014 for our interfaith prayer. Oh God, hear our prayer. In the towering glyphs, we see your majesty. The quiet lakes, we experience your peace. Revive, oh God, the lands and the fields, the water and the air. May the resources we find in it be used for your glory and not for the enrichment of a few. God, creator of the land, we ask for your blessing upon the farmers of the world for water and sun, for fertile soil and good health. May they have freedom to till the land for the feeding of their families and their communities. Guide their tending to respect what you have provided for the flourishing of life, in fact, all of life. God, the creator of the gardens, God, our provider, pour out your gifts on the communities of the world. May they find harmony and relationship and be sustained by the bounty you have given. Help all communities, and especially in this moment, our indigenous communities, to rely upon each other so that the needs of all will be met and hope might be found even in the midst of tragedy. Let us find, let them find uh, flourishment and guide their generosity that their hospitality might reflect your own. God, the creator of community, may the hand of your justice be made known in our food system. Let the benefits be received by all who participate. Let those who labor be paid. Let those who grow food not be made needy. May nourishment reach those who are affected by hunger and even the crumbs by mouths to be fed. God, the creator of justice, bless to us food that is wholesome and that is good. May our tables be filled with the fruits of our local fields. Let all that we eat give life to those who die. Oh, sure. Give strength to our bodies and energy for the work of your justice, peace, and love. Give us, God of the earth and all of the wheat fields, our daily food. That food that does not belong to us, that is yours and given generously food to share, food that is blessed, saturating each person, satisfying hunger and solitude without hoarding or hiding. Do not just give us just the food, give us also the dignity that we are denied to overcome walls and war, greed and ambition. Guide us into safe places where we can meet to celebrate our human diversities. Give us the ability to embrace with compassion and the willingness to share with outstretched hands and sensitive hearts, committed to the fullness of life. Ashe, amen. Thank you very much, uh, Reverend Angelique uh, Walker-Smith. Merci setting beaucoup, us. Angelique Walker-Smith, for cette uh, prière interconfessionnelle. Merci beaucoup. So we now we go into the opening section, opening remarks. We have two. Uh, inputs. Uh, we have two inputs. One from uh, uh, from Dr. David Navarro, and then from uh, Andre Luzzi. Dr. David Navarro uh, is the co-lead 
of the UN Global Crisis Response Group and also the Special Envoy of the WHO Director General for COVID-19. He has been an authority. His, he was, he's rooted in the civil society from his earlier career as a doctor and he has worked extensively uh, with the international community uh, with the WHO and then he went on uh, to help the international community deal with various crises, be it Ebola, COVID, cholera in different regions. And now in the, oh, since, uh, the, 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 since April, he has been actually coordinating this, this uh, the UN Global Crisis Response Group. And his team has been convening uh, meetings, uh, regular fortnightly meetings. And we have been uh, once in two weeks and then collecting all the input from different regions and, and, and passing it on to the UN systems. We welcome you and thank you so much for your tremendous work and welcome you, uh, Dr. David. Thank you. It's, uh, it really is an honor and a privilege to be with you here today. And I'm so grateful to you for inviting me. I see people with whom I meet regularly, uh, members of the Committee on World Food Security, the chair, and parts of the civil society and indigenous people's mechanism. But I know you as people, and I've enjoyed working with you and learning from you over the years. More recently, through Manoj, I was able to interact with the board of the World Council of Churches. And I met several others of you there as well. Uh, both Kenneth and Angelique uh, met, met you, and I've remained in contact with some of you since that time. So I feel I'm returning to be with friends. Now, the UN Secretary General established a global crisis response group on food, energy, and finance on the 14th of March this year. He wanted to use his position to provide high level political leadership for the effort to get ahead of the immense interconnected challenges of food insecurity, energy insecurity, and lack of finance that were emerging and have been and are being exacerbated as a result of the war in Ukraine. The Secretary General also wanted to use his position to encourage a more coordinated global response to the ongoing multi-dimensional crisis. I was invited to join Inga Anderson of UN Environment and Maximo Torero of the Food and Agriculture Organization to co-lead the food work stream of this global crisis response group. From the start, we were working with the Committee on World Food Security and particularly with the chair. And we asked the chair if it would be possible for the Global Crisis Response Group to be connected closely to the different parts of the Committee on Food Security, particularly the civil society and indigenous people's mechanisms because of the work you did during COVID to collect together voices from the ground, which you were also been prepared to do and subsequently done in relation to the current crisis situation. Thank you. Now, I'm very pleased indeed with what Kenneth said when he was introducing his perspective. He Im Im indicated very clearly that there is a succession of interconnected shocks that are coming together and affecting the way in which food energy and finance systems are acting. These shocks include the COVID-19 pandemic, which is still with us. They also include extremes of weather and they include conflicts. They include rising levels of inflation and rising interest rates, and they include high debt burdens. And the consequence of the shocks and the disturbances to systems are really very dramatic indeed. Because there has been a challenge with the availability of certain vital goods and uh, difficulties relating to accessing these vital goods, what we're actually seeing all over the world is that the cost of living for households 
is increasing rapidly and at the same time the purchasing power of households is being reduced because of the devaluation of local currencies and what does this lead to it leads again as kenneth said to increasing levels of poverty and it's uneven this increasing poverty but it's most definite that it's poor people everywhere who are particularly affected by this increase in poverty. It's what we call a slide into ever greater poverty, affecting tens of millions of households. And as they become poorer, as everybody here knows, they have to cope. And that coping often involves activities that lead to reduced nutritional status, reduced access to water, reduced access to health, reduced access to education, reduced personal security. Indeed, it is a challenging time for everybody who is poor. And in societies where there is a social contract between government and poor people, this increasing level of poverty is also affecting the social contract. It's consigning millions of poor people to extreme disadvantage. And it needs structural responses because this impoverishment is not some accident. It's because of the way in which the systems in our work are constructed. The UN Secretary General has asked the Global Crisis Response Group to identify potential solutions. And of course, these include a combination of assistance to people who are extreme need, in extreme need through widespread humanitarian action, protection of people who are in difficulty through widespread social protection, but also structural interventions with a view to transforming food systems, energy systems and finance systems so that they better benefit poor people and poor nations. Civil society and faith communities are absolutely key. Yeah. Governments can't respond to the high level of need throughout our world. And oftentimes it is civil society, it is faith organizations who respond to the needs of those who are particularly vulnerable in helping them to avoid extreme situations. They, but they also help to keep attention to the structural and operational reforms that are necessary for the realization of the sustainable development goals. And that structural reform at the local, national and global levels that give much greater opportunity to disadvantaged groups, whether they are children or women or older people, disabled people, indigenous people, minority people, indeed all those who tend to be excluded and marginalized, they're the people who need to be enabled to realize their human rights, to live in dignity, to enjoy equitable opportunities, and to be able to benefit from what society has to offer now and in the future. Thank you for all you do to help the Global Crisis Response Group with its work. Thank you very much, uh, David, uh, for your for your remarks and for your for your work and helping us to move into this. Uh, into the into the into the meat of the discussions, the regional discussion. But before we go in, uh, I'm inviting Andre Lutzi. Uh, he's uh, from Brazil and the coordinator of the CSIPM's Global Food Governance Working Group. And and you know it, it has been a, a phenomenal uh, work that has been going on. Uh, the, the 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 CSIPM has been doing regional consultations all over the world, uh, initially in 2019, and now following up for the second round this year. So Andre will give us, inform us about the 
a CSF uh, 50 and, and, and give us an introduction regarding the uh, regional consultation. Over to you, Andre. Gracias, Manoa. Es un gran placer para nosotros, nosotras, participar de este proceso una vez más. Y estas consultas populares y regionales recalcan nuestra vocación para un proceso que sea participativo, inclusivo, pero también más que sea una popularización de la gobernanza global. Que las personas sujetas de derecho, de derecho humano a la alimentación, estén en la escena política, en la escena pública, para traer sus demandas, necesidades, sus saberes, para construir políticas transformadoras. Este es, un, este es nuestro informe global de las consultas populares, y yo voy a solicitar a Betsy, mi compañera del mecanismo, para la siguiente hoja, que podemos tratar cada momento muy distinto de nuestro proceso. Durante las consultas, creamos un cuestionario electrónico para ampliar la participación de las personas. Fueron más de 539 contribuciones de los distintos actores y actrices, personas que más son afectadas por la inseguridad alimentaria, camponeses y camponesas, también las personas que viven en las ciudades, pastoraleses, la población LGBT que más, las personas que trabajan con encuestas, pesquisas. Y tuvimos también en este cuestionario puntos claves para el debate. ¿Cómo están los impactos de la pandemia en nuestras comunidades y el derecho humano a la alimentación? cómo las distintas capas de las crisis afectan el derecho a la alimentación, así como los conflictos y la guerra. Tratamos también de punto de vista de, la, de género de las mujeres y también de los jóvenes, para que puedan contribuir para el seguimiento de las directrices que fueron aprobadas y que tengan elementos para nuestros procesos siguientes. Y por fin, tratamos de la gobernanza global y también el papel rol de las corporaciones. Vimos también 20 horas de participación y percibimos que hay un carácter sistémico y estructural de las crisis. Y en este, puede la siguiente, gracias. Vimos un carácter sistémico y estructural de las crisis, donde los sistemas alimentarios actual provocan crisis recurrentes. El cambio climático catastrófico, el racismo ambiental, la pobreza y desigualdad extrema. Percibimos también que hay una visión hasta hoy de la alimentación como una mercancía especulativa y que en gran parte es para beneficiar las empresas, las grandes corporaciones. Hay ainda hoy una dependencia excesiva de las cadenas de valor mundiales y la producción con base en los combustibles fósiles. Estas son las causas mutuas y profundas de esta crisis y precisamos tratar de ellas como de las normas comerciales y de inversiones que son injustas y no hay una regulación del mercado. También percibimos que los países con altos niveles de inundamiento y dependencia de la importación no pueden participar activamente de las decisiones en el ambiente de la gobernanza global. En la siguiente hoja vamos a ver que las respuestas globales son hasta hoy fragmentadas, superficiales, tratan aparentemente de las consecuencias, mas no van a profundizando y tratando de las causas. Por ejemplo, la propia FAO, gran parte de sus respuestas están comprometidas con el comercio de productos básicos y de fertilizantes. En el grupo de respuestas de la crisis mundial, alimentaria, energética y financiera, también la preocupación mayor es con garantizar los flujos mundiales de cereales y de fertilizantes químicos. Y mismo en la declaración ministerial sobre la respuesta a emergencia a la inseguridad alimentaria, la perspectiva es de más liberalización del comercio alimentario y agrícola y de producción. O sea, todos los testimonios de nuestros sectores, de los constituyentes del mecanismo, de los pueblos más afectados, no son considerados en estas respuestas. 
Vamos a ver en la siguiente hoja que las crisis también es una fragilidad de los espacios de gobernanza multilateral. Mismo con los organismos basados en Roma, en este grupo de enfrentamiento a las crisis, llamado por el secretario general, el G7, y tantos otros espacios, la preocupación más amplia es con la productividad, con la perspectiva de los mercados, con el interés de las corporaciones y no basada en garantizar la soberanía alimentaria, los derechos humanos y promover una efectiva participación de los sujetos de derechos, de los derechos humanos y de los derechos humanos a la alimentación y nutrición. En nuestra parte, vamos a ver en la siguiente hoja, nuestro interés mayor es dar evidencia desde nuestros territorios que las crisis son resultados de desigualdades exacerbadas y profundas, históricas, estructurantes, basadas en el racismo, en la misoginia, en distintas maneras de discriminación, la xenofobia, por ejemplo, y también un modelo económico basado en el capitalismo y su agenda neoliberal, que saca nuestros derechos, no permita que nosotros permanezcamos en nuestros territorios y no podemos tratar de nuestros bien común, que son los recursos naturales. Y esto está provocando catástrofes meteorológicas extremas, están sacando nuestros alimentos que son base de nuestra existencia, porque la alimentación hay dimensión física, comunitaria, emocional y también espiritual, ya que estamos aquí en un consejo de iglesias, por ejemplo. Tenemos distintas maneras de construir nuestra cosmovisión y el alimento es muy central en nuestra cultura alimentaria. También estamos viviendo cada vez más el uso del alimento como una arma de geopolítica, arma de guerra. La alimentación es muchas veces utilizada como forma de control del social y también de opresión. Esto es una amenaza a los derechos humanos. Y en este momento, en este encuentro, debemos firmar nuestro llamado ético a un llamado civilizatorio para que no tengamos más guerra, que tengamos la paz como fruto de justicia, como por ejemplo de justicia alimentaria. Y no vemos la participación. En la siguiente hoja, por favor, Betsy, podemos ver que necesitamos de nuestros territorios profundos cambios para la participación, para la gobernanza global de los sistemas alimentarios y llegar a medidas a corto y medio y largo plazos desde una perspectiva de soberanía alimentaria, de la agroecología y de foco a los derechos humanos. Vamos a ver entonces cómo eso puede suceder. De medios, de, de, las medidas a corto plazo deben y considerar suministrar ayuda humanitaria garantizando las condiciones para que las personas refuercen los sistemas alimentarios locales. Apoyar estas iniciativas comunitarias que están en curso, que fueron las primeras para garantizar nuestra existencia, regulando al mismo tiempo la distribución de, proces, de productos ultraprocesados. Garantizar los accesos a los productores en pequeña escala a los alimentos, pero también a los insumos nacionales para que no tenga más la dependencia de los productos externos. Frenar la especulación alimentaria. Lo alimento no es mercancía, alimento es derecho, es nuestra vinculación con la trascendencia. Y también es muy necesario una reestructuración y cancelación de deudas privadas y públicas y garantizar una mayor eh, condición de gravar el exceso de beneficios y la riqueza extrema. Ahora, vamos a pensar a largo plazo, por favor, Betsy. A largo plazo, tenemos que romper la dependencia de las importaciones de alimentos. Es muy necesario transformar los sistemas alimentarios mediante la agroecología, estos distintos saberes, la cosmovisión que nuestros pueblos originales, nuestras comunidades más afectadas tienen y que pueden dar solución 
para nuestra existencia al planeta, así garantizando la soberanía alimentaria. Y por fin, basar todas estas respuestas a la realización de los derechos humanos y al multilateralismo democrático. Por fin, yo voy a mostrar cómo nosotros pensamos que puede ser esta coordinación de las respuestas. En este diagrama podemos ver que hay posibilidades concretas y efectivo, utilizando el documento de reforma del CCA, garantizando el poder convocatorio del CCA para coordinación mundial, adoptando medidas en distintos niveles y distintos plazos, asimismo como recomendaciones financieras para que las medidas sean utilizadas, garantizar en efectivo la participación de nosotros, nosotras, y también de nuestros estados miembros que son más afectados y muchas veces no pueden participar en mismas condiciones en ambiente de gobernanza. También debemos utilizar el marco estratégico mundial para seguridad alimentaria y nutrición que está en el documento de reforma, así como otros instrumentos, y debe tener un papel, un rol bastante significativo el Ganesan para que pueda producir un seguimiento en múltiples dimensiones de cómo son los impactos de las crisis y frenar futuras crisis, garantizando también la participación de nuestros pueblos en este proceso de seguimiento. Muchísimas gracias. Dejamos aquí un poco más de información sobre nuestro proceso y también invitamos a ustedes a conocer nuestro informe eh, completo y parafraseando el apóstol Pablo que decía de esperanza en esperanza. Aquí dejo una mensaje nuestra. De esperanza en esperanza caminamos en defensa de nuestra existencia, de existencia del planeta por derechos y la soberanía alimentaria. Muchísimas gracias y tengamos en el 19 de diciembre respuestas comprometidas con todos estos puntos que nuestros seguimientos presentaron a ustedes. Y vamos a conocer ahora las distintas respuestas también a nivel local y regional. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you, thank you very much, Andre, for this brilliant overview over the over all uh, the and, and consolidating the key points from the from the regional consultations and really giving us the headlines. And you have your challenge is very clear. And uh, thank you for your for your contributions and your hard work and for your leadership. Now I pass on um, uh, the the uh, the moderatorship to Magdalena. Over to you, Magdalena. Thank you, Manoj, and thank you so much, Andre. Um, I, we will now move uh, forward with the program, uh, listening uh, to the inputs from the regions, as Andre has pointed out, um, people from the regions, people's evidence, the evidence from the territories have been echoed have been echoing uh, throughout uh, the messages that Andre has has shared with us with us today. Uh, but now we will have the moment to listen to the particular context and the particular uh, impacts uh, within the different regions. So first, um, we will give the, the floor to uh, Saima Zia. Um, Saima is a member of the Pakistan uh, Kisan Rabita, Rabita Committee, uh, which itself is a member of La Via Campesina. Uh, Saima is connecting from uh, Pakistan today, and she is a member of the Coordination Committee of the CSIPM. Uh, so Saima, over to you to present um, the inputs and the results from the popular consultation in South and Central Asia. Thank you, Magdalena. Thank you so much. Um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not using my headphone. I read the email about that, but I just found it out. It's broken. I just, I used it in uh, a few, uh, just one and a half hour back, and now it's not working. So sorry for that. I, I hope it. Uh, I'm loud enough for the interpreters, and if there will be any issue, please let me know. So, uh, uh, as Andre has uh, uh, already uh, um, uh, have been presented in detail in, in his presentation that 
uh, how uh, was the COVID-19 impacts were there in the communities and uh, uh, during the consultation, what we found it out uh, in uh, South, Asia, uh, South Asia and Central Asia, some of the impacts were uh, on the communities uh, that have been like most affected uh, uh, communities were the urban poor and uh, the rural poor. And uh, in, uh, in urban poor, uh, they have been um, so many people. Uh, uh, young people and uh, also uh, they they lost jobs you know, who were working in the in the factories in the in the industrial areas and they were living in the urban uh, slum areas and uh, uh, that was because government you know when the this covid uh, happened and uh, the government uh, they they uh, announced the lockdown without any planning there were no planning that how they will uh, 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 cope up this this issue and uh, all of a sudden all the transportation have been blocked like people can't move to other cities to other places because the transportation and all the roads they have been blocked so people who were living in uh, in, in uh, rural area uh, in urban slum areas they belong actually to the rural, rural areas and they they have been uh, they have to go back because they they have no job and they are working at uh, mostly uh, uh, 60% people they lost their job and uh, they have to move back to rural areas because they were not able to pay their rent and all the utility bills and then uh, it was a big problem for them how they can go back to their uh, uh, to their homes and then they uh, uh, somehow they managed to get back there and that was a huge problem and then the, that all, all the burden have been shifted to the rural areas from the urban slum areas so uh, it it has been uh, uh, there was uh, a lot of problems related to that and also people uh, in urban areas and they especially they they faced a short shortage of food uh, you know uh, food crisis because uh, uh, the uh, because of the uh, blockage of every transportation and roads and the farmers were not able to bring their uh, products to the markets so farmers, small scale farmers, they also suffered. Their product have been, uh, you know, rotting, rotting uh, down in the in the ground in the fields, and uh, the urban poor they were not able to get food. Uh, the problem was not with the rich people because they they bought uh, fo food in bulk and they stored at their homes. But people who were earning at daily wages, they were not able to get food because they were not able to get, they, they lost their jobs and they can't buy. And also food prices have been increased during that time. So uh, that was a big issue for the, for the people who are, uh, who are workers, who are daily wagers, who are small scale farmers, because all the farmers, they are not growing all the products. Obviously they need, if someone is growing wheat, they need to buy vegetables from other farmers. So uh, the next thing is was like uh, uh, the most in these most marginalized communities, women and children, they were, you know, at the uh, at, at the bottom, and they were women have to face more domestic violence during this time. That case cases have so many cases have been reported, and uh, and because of financial crisis, the tension and you know like um, uh, the uh, financial uh, uh, sport was not there so that's why women need to feed the children and that create a lot of uh, problems for them how they can how they can get food in the markets food prices increased and uh, also some of the food items they were uh, they were also not available so uh, uh, especially uh, when we when we talk about uh, uh, the other uh, other aspect of that uh, in some of the countries lockdown was not that much long for example in Pakistan lockdown was not that much long but after the lockdown still the uh, the uh, government you know announced that there is no lockdown after four months but still factories and all the industrial uh, industries have not been open because there was no industrial material available so people were not able to get their jobs again for the longer period of time 
and uh, after uh, after uh, after the covid uh, lockdown over still people are, who are getting their jobs they there is a pay cut like uh, almost uh, 40 to 60% pay cut for for the for the for all the workers and uh, uh, that was like uh, a huge burden to the people and government uh, uh, there was no actually uh, support from the government side and the government announced some of the support for the uh, for, for the people who are who lost their jobs but that has been like only 5 to 10% people were able to get that support and all the others they were at their own and I during might... that time, Sorry to interrupt you, but if you could um, uh, start uh, wrapping up your intervention. Yeah, uh, that's, thank that's, you that's so much. I'm, I'm, I'm going to the last part. That why, that's why I, uh, I'm on the government response. Like, uh, uh, and then uh, uh, the people who in, in, within the community, within the groups, the mechanism people developed at their own that worked better than the government. They uh they they managed to uh sustain themselves they uh, developed a support system that how the how we they can support the small scale farmers to bring, bring their products to the markets and uh, 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 the community groups the cooperatives the uh, farmers and people who are working in these groups that were more more effective uh, during that time rather than the uh, they they were waiting for uh, support uh, mechanism or any support from the government. So uh, I think it's Magdalene already informed me to be brief. And uh, I think it's uh, uh, maybe some point I missed, but not the whole, but that was like uh, what I have got it in my mind right now. Thank you so much, Magdalene. Over to you now. Thank you so much, Saima. Yes, we have a lot of inputs today, so we need to be uh, quite brief. Um, I will now uh, move on to the inputs from Southeast Asia and the Pacific, and this will be shared by Irish Bagilat. Uh, Irish is a member of uh, the Asian Farmers Association for Sustainable Rural Development, AFA, and she's also a member of the CSIPM's uh, coordination committee. So Irish, over to you. Yes, uh, thank you, Magdalena, and good afternoon uh, or good morning, good evening to everyone. Uh, greetings from uh, Montreal, where the CBD COP is uh, taking place. It's uh, an honor to share with you the, the summary of the CSIPM Southeast Asia and the Pacific consultation that we have organized on the 14th and the 21st of July. So uh, during the consultation, we it was in a hybrid mode. We had... Um, 20 participants in Cambodia joining in person and then 40 online from Indonesia, Thailand, Vietnam, Laos, Philippines, and uh, Australia, representing uh, indigenous peoples, women, youth, farmers, organizations, and CSOs. And um, I want to, uh, to, to highlight first that uh, many of our constituents, uh, members in Southeast Asian countries and also the Pacific, are already tackling several challenges and the COVID-19 and the other crisis that came has aggravated the difficult situation that we are already experiencing and that uh, the situation in the past few years is uh, really unspeakable for uh, many of us. So I want to highlight um, a few of the, the impacts that were uh, shared during the consultation. So food insecurity increased uh, definitely during uh, lockdowns and restri the restrictions. Government didn't have safety nets or social protection in place for people who relied on daily wages, the urban workers and informal uh, workers in particular. And there was no immediate and appropriate actions for those who cannot buy in uh, big volumes. And because transportation... Uh, were were disrupted transportation of foods and goods were disrupted with uncoordinated efforts of national and local governments we had a situation where food are wasted and lost in the rural areas and there is a lack of fresh and nutritious food in the urban areas second economic loss were experienced at various intensity and has deepened the economic inequality um 
uh, it has already been uh, presented earlier that farmers, fishers were unable to transport their goods. And then we also have livestock diseases in the past a few years. We have the avian flu, the African swine fever. Uh, which proliferated from 2020 to 2021. And you've also seen some of the, in the news, the intense rains, floodings, and typhoons in the past uh, uh, years resulting to loss of farm produce and has increased indebtedness among our constituents, the farmers and the fishers and other vulnerable uh, groups. And also the cost of uh, the cost for fishers to access the fishing grounds has increased due to the fuel price increase that we are currently experiencing as you know until today and in cambodia one of the worst case is that uh, you know imprisonments were reported because uh, people cannot pay their their loans because you know of of the economic loss that they have experienced third social cultural practices in agriculture was disrupted one example is the labor sharing and this was because of the social distancing physical distancing measures uh, that were uh, were uh, implemented there were also cases where crops and livestock were not tended to because family members contracted covid and that family that the family has to be isolated and then there were also banning of certain agricultural practices during you know the past few years with no alternatives to be offered by the government and uh, last two points, there there were uh, cases of land grabbing, land use change, and resource conflict re conflicts reported in Cambodia and in the Philippines. And also policies were passed in the past few year, two years that were detrimental to local communities. Uh, cases in Indonesia, the om Omnibus Bill on Job Creation, and also in the Philippines, the Rice Certification Law. On the crisis uh, response, participants uh, expressed that the recovery the recovery measures didn't focus on public food infrastructures. There's still weak coordination of response and lack of recognition for intersectoral pol policy response. However, we have also seen some actions that actually worked. In Vietnam, for example, state regulation on food price prices and inflation, plus the ample uh, rice supply has kept food prices low. So there was no food crisis in, in Vietnam. In, in the Philippines and Indonesia, tapping into cooperatives for food distribution, buying and selling of farmers produce, it has also uh, worked well. We have seen positive outcomes from solidarity-based uh, responses like people-to-people -people support and food sharing. And also a number of governments provide uh, direct cash assistance. And yeah, in, in the Philippines, uh, agriculture, farming, and indigenous practices were actually valorized uh, because, you know, of, of the challenges we have uh, had. And there were, you know, there were food markets organized for urban workers, and there were community markets uh, organized where farmers, fishers can actually uh, trade their uh, products and uh, the food and the goods. Um, I want to end with some of the, the priority demands uh, that we have uh, uh, we have uh, agreed, and these were already fed into the the document uh, that will be shared or that has been shared. So we would ask our partners to support the call to stop monopolization and end liberalization of agriculture, and that um, continue to restore traditional species, seeds, and sharing culture among uh, communities and support food producers to produce safe food and ensure that the food we produce comes from uh, safe production sites. For example, no records of rights violation and environmental destruction. And help us raise awareness so consumers would seek to know where their food came from. And that we ask uh, uh, governments and international mechanisms to uphold inclusive and participatory policymaking in food and agriculture and recognize the indigenous people's rights over uh, their land and resources. And also we call for price control over basic goods and engage youth in solving agricultural uh, problems. We need to revive social movements to increase social pressure on governments to uphold their duties to the people, build and strengthen intersectional grass, grassroots formation. And lastly, um, foster local initiatives, grassroots experiences. They must be harnessed and implemented in a bigger scale. And that for governments to continue to respond and support uh, community and local initiatives. Thank you and back to you, Magdalena. Thank you so much, Irish, uh, and all the best of luck uh, in COP CBD.
Um, now we move to the um, European uh, and um, Western Asian region, uh, where uh, D Woods will be presenting. Uh, Sorry, I think I was muted. Um, Passons à maintenant à la région Europe et uh, Asie occidentale. Dee Woods va nous présenter sa présentation des résultats de la consultation populaire. Dee Woods uh, fait partie de la Land Workers Alliance, un membre de la Défense Dee Woods est également membre du comité de coordination du MSCPA. Dee Um, thank you, Magdalena. Um, I think we're here in French in the English booth. Um, and I'd just like everyone to excuse my voice. I'm battling the flu for the last couple of weeks. So um, the consultation was actually carried out in Western and Central Asia, as well as Europe. Um, at the outset of the war in Ukraine, many states and bodies were slow to respond with much needed humanitarian aid. Civil society caravans quickly mobilized from as far as Southwest England and Wales, traveling through various regions across Europe, gathering life-sustaining supplies of clothing, medicines, food, seeds, and tools. Small-scale producers and fields in Ukraine continue to produce food to feed a fleeing population, as did millions of small producers in rural, peri-urban, and urban areas from across Europe, Central, and Western Asia, feeding people in their local regions. The consultation showed that small-scale food producers and wider civil society have strong solidarity in responding to multiple crises, from the pandemic to the energy crisis, the cost of living crisis, and growing crisis of household food <coughs> insecurity. This region has condemned the geopolitical weaponization of food in the Ukraine war and has called for the respect, protection and fulfillment of human rights and agroecological transformation as fundamental for food sovereignty for everyone. Um, so part of the consultation was enriched with contributions from the Russian Federation, countries of community of independent states and from Ukraine, as well as um, England and the devolved nations, Croatia, Georgia, Tajikistan, um, and many more. The main messages coming out of the consultation was, one, the war in Ukraine and the result in migration, destruction of infrastructure and destruction of supply chains and export markets is affecting agri-food corporations. Small-scale food producers have proven to be more adaptable by planting more crops and actively supplying local markets with fresh produce. In face of sanctions since 2014, the agro-industrial sector has been focusing on import substitutes. Substitution. I would like to emphasize that in all territories, small scale food producers continue to produce food and food is available. There is no shortage of food. Despite this, the rise in food prices have led to increased hunger and food insecurity in all parts of Europe, with more and new categories of the populations becoming dependent on charitable food aid. Farmers themselves face difficult choices given the need to change their farming methods and pressure to produce more, the adverse effects of the climate emergency, increased production costs and price pressure from food processors and retailers. Inequalities are also on rise 
um, based on multiple forms of discrimination, including class, gender, race, sexuality, disability, age, rurality, and origin. Um, and this has affected the mobilization and participation of our rights holders in public policy decision makers. The agro-industry lobby using war in Ukraine to argue the, for the status quo and to not advance with the critical climate and biodiversity transitions and transformation of food systems. Responses remained punctual and fragmented, focusing merely on consequences rather than on addressing the structural causes of the neoliberal model and the lack of public re regulation. Emergency funds and subsidies were largely captured by big corporations from pharmaceutical and energy sectors, leaving windfall profits untouched. There was little support to vulnerable sectors, small-scale producers and workers, and public policies hardly recognized the persistent efforts made by those engaged in agroecological transition, social and solidarity economy, and territorial dynamics. So what needs to happen now? We need a radical transformation of food systems based on human rights and agroecology. Um, the right to food needs to be enshrined and realized regionally to address increasing food insecurity and protect the rights of marginalized communities, the food insecure, indigenous peoples, peasants and other people working in rural areas, women and youth. We also need the strengthening of territorial food systems, which must go hand in hand with public policies that regulate markets and revise trade relations so as to serve human beings and not the profit of the corporate sector. In this harsh winter, many people of all backgrounds, including children, sit in the cold and dark or sleep rough on the streets without food. Many are sick and some will die this winter. I ask what more needs to happen before action is taken. Gwendolyn Brooks wrote, we are each other's harvest. We are each other's business. We are each other's magnitude and bond. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dee, uh, for also uh, these uh, powerful uh, messages, uh, concluding messages. Um, Dee and Irish have been uh, mentioning the impacts uh, on youth and the impacts from a gender perspective. So in this sense, we will now hear uh, from uh, Katlego Mahuma uh, from the World Council of Churches. Uh, Katlego, Katlego will be uh, presenting uh, the perspective of the youth uh, as consumers, as producers, and uh, how the impact of the crisis have been uh, affecting uh, the youth. So, uh, Katlego, over to you. You have five minutes. Thank you, Magdalena. Um, good evening or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, I, I just wish to highlight some of the ways that the youth are affected by the food crisis and some of the ways they have um, responded or the youth has responded to some of their challenges. Um, food insecurity remains a persistent problem in the world, affecting approximately 29 percent of the global population and in the last three years since 2019 uh, the number of undernourished people grew by 150 million um, and this particular crisis has been driven primarily by the COVID-19 pandemic as well as the, co uh, the conflict in Ukraine and uh, between Ukraine and Russia in the last year as well as of course climate change and that those effects. It is estimated that 60% of, of, of the world's hungry people live in countries that are experiencing active conflict. And so we continue to see, and it is uh, evident that conflict disrupts the harvest that, and hampers the delivery of humanitarian aid. That, and um, we see this also in the disruption and the displacement of people who flee from these countries. 
in the developing world where these uh, where where there's extreme poverty and lack of access to nutritious food and there's poorly monitored migration driven by these conflicts and political instability young people and children remain the most vulnerable to hunger and malnutrition today over 22% of children under the age of 5 are stunted and over 8 million of them are at risk of dying from malnutrition and those who are especially prone to hunger and its deadly effects are up to nine times more likely to die from malnutrition and common infections that could be resolved um, than their better nourished peers. For young people of working age, um, between 18 and 35 years old, the hunger and food insecurity challenge they face also relates in part to the rapid urbanization and in part to the structural unemployment crisis. Over 70 million of youth of working age globally are unemployed for long periods of time, even after obtaining university degrees or skills training for their various vocations. And this informs the absence of reliable income which impacts their ability to afford and purchase food from the market. And this is, of course, a problem because in an urbanized world or in a rapidly urbanizing world, um, income is a key determinant for food security. And so people rely on income to be able to access food and prepare that food. The recent Russian invasion into Ukraine has exacerbated these pre-existing realities with food prices um, hiking to unprecedented numbers in the last year. Youth in developing and emerging countries are being hit hard and the hardest due to their reliance on the region in, in Europe uh, or the, the region where Ukraine and Russia is because we depend uh, on them for fuel and grain imports. Some of the responses by youth um, to these crises. At the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, many youth, uh, many young people responded to the challenge of hunger by starting to grow their own food for sustenance where they could, um, where they could, some in their backyards and some even began to collaborate uh, with their peers to farm on a larger scale and create businesses to be able to make an income as well as to be able to feed themselves and to take advantage of the gap in the local markets where the existing supply was not able to match the demand at the time, especially with the halt of export and import trading. So for those youth who became entrepreneurs in the food system, they faced their own challenges in the last year caused by the hike of prices and inputs, particularly fuel and fertilizer, and of course, the age old problem of a lack of land or arable land amongst other things. While farmers grow food hydroponically to overcome the lack of access to arable land, many continue to do so unguided, especially when it comes to treating crops in the event that they're ridden with disease. Another challenge is that they are not so knowledgeable about the expectations of trading and some of the market barriers and some governance issues, as well as um, a lack of finance and access to finance for operations and the necessary tools. So these are the things that continue to make it difficult and challenging for young people to continue to use entrepreneurship effectively as a tool and a sustainable response to the food insecurity crisis. So these are some of the areas where youth can benefit from a globally coordinated uh, strategy and response uh, to the food crisis in terms of technical support, financial investment and advocacy. As I close off, I just want to invite us to share and collaborate on an, an urgent globally coordinated response to design and maintain food systems that are not only profit driven, but also prioritize the affordability and accessibility of food for poor people, especially young people. Ours is to work together towards building corporates whose models prioritize or whose models are prioritizing of life and dignity and those that operate in an economy that values human life and do not undermine human dignity. 
we need corporates that also prioritize environmental sustainability while pursuing economic and financial sustainability. Thank you, Magdalena. Thank you so much, uh, Katlego, for uh, presenting uh, how um, the youth has been challenged uh, by uh, the, the crisis uh, and the responses that they have been uh, giving, no? Uh, and the urgency of a global coordinated response, uh, not based on, on profit. Um, so uh, we were meant to have a segment of discussions now, but we are quite behind time. So I would encourage all of you, if you have questions or comments, if you could put them on the chat. Um, if there's someone who wants to uh, raise a question, a comment, uh, now I would invite maybe just one or two interventions uh, from the participants, uh, and then we continue with uh, the presentations from the regions. So I see no hands up. Um, so please continue to comment and uh, raise questions through the chat. Um, and we maybe continue with the presentations from the regions. Um, now uh, I will invite uh, Mirienzi Gonzalez uh, to speak. Uh, Mirienzi Gonzalez is a part of the group of uh, international relations of uh, Maela, um, uh, and she is also a part of the CSIPM coordination committee. Uh, Mirienzi will be presenting the results uh, of the popular regional consultation of Latin America and the Caribbean. So I invite Mirienzi to speak, um, and maybe also Betsy can share the slides uh, she has prepared. Mirienzi, over to you. Un agradecimiento a Magdalena, a nuestros compañeros del Mecanismo de la Sociedad Civil y un fraterno saludo para todas las personas que se encuentran en este momento escuchándonos y presentes en la sala. Bueno, yo voy a presentar el informe de Latinoamérica y el Caribe. Básicamente todos hemos coincidido en los resultados, pero específicamente en el caso de América Latina, eh, discúlpenme un momento, yo voy a hacer una precisión. En América Latina participamos 34 agentes de movimientos sociales en la consulta. La consulta se realizó entre los meses de mayo y agosto del 2022. Participamos Colombia, México, Guatemala, Brasil, Bolivia, Haití, Perú, Argentina, Paraguay, Costa Rica. Y se realizaron dos consultas eh, a través de Zoom. Una se hizo abierta con participación de eh, las academias, eh, los gobiernos y organizaciones regionales y la otra se hizo de manera restringida a los movimientos sociales y a todos los agentes de la sociedad civil. Bueno, digamos que, que cuando el compañero André hizo la presentación, pues él sintetizó de manera muy importante eh, los resultados eh, a nivel general. A nivel específico, eh, nosotros encontramos una gran profundización de las desigualdades ya preexistentes en la región. Hubo eh, en toda la región precarización de, del trabajo para las personas que tenían relaciones laborales. Se profundizó la emigración eh, con una considerable fuga de jóvenes hacia otros territorios, eh, como en todos los lados hubo un, una ausencia de programas para que se accediera a la tierra y a servicios públicos e, esenciales. Eh, se hizo eh, a través de, las, de los incentivos otorgados por los gobiernos nacionales, eh, hubo discriminación hacia la producción campesina, eh, favoreciendo siempre las megaindustrias de los conglomerados alimentarios, Se profundizó la violencia intrafamiliar, 
específicamente contra mujeres y niñas. Eh, hubo un empobrecimiento de la participación política y en algunos casos, como en el caso nuestro, eh, en Colombia se presentó un muy fuerte estallido social con un considerable número de asesinatos y de mm, atropellos por parte de la fuerza pública. A nivel de los pueblos indígenas, la pandemia tuvo un fuerte impacto a nivel espiritual y cultural y lo que vimos a través de esos incentivos otorgados por, por los distintos gobiernos fue un aumento de la captura corporativa de los sistemas alimentarios. También hubo manipulación cultural e ideológica a través de los medios de comunicación, eh, publicidad dirigida y mm, hubo también eh, una deserción escolar muy importante eh, para muchos eh, niños y jóvenes en nuestras regiones, el sistema escolar es la garantía del acceso, por lo menos, a un alimento, eh, los refrigerios, y al, a los niños quedarse en sus casas se vieron limitados en el acceso a ese alimento, lo que generó muchísima deserción. Eh, los niños eh, aguantaron muchísima hambre, en este sentido y es una situación pues que, que, que aún se está presentando. ¿Cuáles fueron los impactos de la pandemia? Entonces, profundización de la desigualdad. Ah, no, ya habíamos visto esto, sigue por favor. Eh, también a la capa eh, de crisis alimentaria que generó el COVID-19 en todo el planeta, se agrega el impacto de la guerra con Ucrania. Esto ha generado una persistencia en el aumento de los precios de los alimentos básicos y de los insumos para la producción agrícola, de los alimentos que se producen de manera agroindustrial. Eh, esto sigue concentrando y acelerando eh, la agenda de las grandes corporaciones en la, regi en la, en la, regi en la región. Eh, Hubo um, de la misma manera un acelere en, en la agricultura digital, en la introducción de transgénicos, en control de los mercados y en la especulación, eh, en detrimento de la agricultura campesina, familiar, comunitaria, étnica, que fue la agricultura que permitió a través de circuitos cortos que muchísimas familias y especialmente en las zonas urbanas pudieran acceder a los alimentos. Se generó un escenario de especulación abierta, eh, las grandes plataformas eh, entregando alimentos ultraprocesados, altísimos costos, y la producción campesina que se ofrecía en las calles, eh, pese a la represión que se hacía desde los estados, eh, asequible, pero eh, totalmente estigmatizada. Continuemos, por favor. Miriam, sí, sí, podrías ir cerrando también, eh, que bueno, ya vamos cinco minutos. Bueno, eh, ¿cuáles, digamos, serían las, las propuestas? Entonces, eh, fortalecer la agroecología como el camino para garantizar la soberanía alimentaria. Eh, otro de los caminos es garantizar la vida de los defensores de derechos humanos, que en América Latina es un tema muy complicado, especialmente los defensores del agua, los bosques y la biodiversidad. Seguir priorizando como lo está haciendo el gobierno de Colombia en una reforma agraria integral y popular y establecer mecanismos para la protección de los territorios y finalmente asegurar la gestión de políticas públicas con, eh, con instrumentos financieros adecuados. No se pueden establecer políticas sin esos mecanismos porque los mecanismos es lo que hace que las políticas puedan ser eh, desarrolladas en los territorios. Eh, pedir a los gobiernos progresistas, eh, para cerrar ahí, eh, de la región que se revisen y se ajusten los tratados de libre comercio, porque fue a través de los tratados de, de libre comercio la imposición específicamente de algunos gobiernos que se mercantilizó el alimento. Es, quien, tiene tu, quien tiene tu autonomía tiene tu alimento. Uh, como dice un proverbio, quien tiene 
eh, tu alimento no puede ser un instrumento para, para la guerra. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you so much, uh, Mirienzi, for presenting uh, the results from the Latin America and Caribbean region. Um, now, uh, Patty Naylor uh, from uh, the National Family Farm Coalition, member of La Via Campesina, will be presenting um, the outcomes of the consultation in North America. Uh, Patty, over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Magdalena. Thank you, everyone. It is very humbling to be here, uh, hearing from the uh, reports from the, from the regions around the world. Um, I am, uh, will be speaking from the North American subregion, which consists of Canada and the United States, two major agricultural exporting countries that also share the legacy and enduring effects of settler colonialism and of imperialism. During the pandemic and now the food and farm food and food price crises, we have seen huge increases in wealth inequalities with the most marginalized suffering the most. The results of our people's consultation highlighted these inequalities and the vulnerabilities created by a globalized food system characterized by a very fragile supply chain and an oversupply of commodities grown to feed corporate-owned livestock raised in confinements and to produce biofuels. However, it also showed the resiliency of people and communities. Canada and the United States both have many indigenous communities who have experienced the injustice Patty? I think we lost Patty. Um, so, um, in order maybe to. Uh, ah, Patty, hey, can you hear us? My camera, if that's okay. Yeah, please. Um, Go ahead. Okay. Um, I, I was speaking of indigenous communities. Um, these communities are being affected by climate change and by the intrusion of agribusiness and energy industries into their ter uh, traditional territories. And they are at high risk for food insecurity. Yet indigenous communities are implementing food sovereignty initiatives, teaching their languages and cultures to their children, and building mutual aid networks. Black communities and communities with people of color too often live in food deserts and in areas with serious environmental contamination of air, water, and land. Solidarity economies and urban gardens are their key methods of resistance. Food chain workers and farm workers are usually immigrants and people of color. Their working conditions worsened during the pandemic when they were deemed essential workers, yet were not given the means to protect their health. On a regular basis, these workers must work in very difficult situations. Community organizations assist them with childcare, health clinics, and community gardens. And we have inspiring examples of youth, women, non-binary individuals, and BIPOC people who are finding ways to access land, produce food for their communities, and renew and heal relationships with fellow human beings and with nature. Our consultation found that government policies fail to address the inequalities of the capitalist system and a lack of strong policy coordination from local to national levels further represented a failure of governments to provide viable solutions as duty bearers. This reality has led to consciousness building about the need for radical food system transformation. I will end with just two, hi hi highlighting just two of our demands. We want coherent policies to stop corporate capture, shift the power imbalance and prioritize smaller family scale agroecological food production and territorial food systems. These policies need to be global and would include minimum price supports for agricultural goods, 
parity policies, food reserves, and the termination of the World Food Organ World Trade Organization's agreement on agriculture to be replaced with trade policies that center food sovereignty, human rights, and truly sustainable food systems. And we demand policies and programs to address the land consolidation trend and ensure land access and tenure for food producers, particularly for BIPOC communities and for young people. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Patty. So we can hear across the speakers that agroecology uh, is being echoed as a, a transformative pathway for the transformation we need uh, for food systems. Um, now, um, Sefu Sani from the World March of Women, uh, connecting from Kenya, uh, will be uh, presenting uh, the the results from the Africa region. Uh, Sefu Sani is also a member of the CSIBM's uh, coordination committee. Sefu, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Magdalena. And uh, I will go right into it. Uh, the results of the Africa popular consultation and uh, the participants included the network of African peasants, the fisher folk, pastoralists, pastoralists, agricultural workers, the urban food insecure, the consumers, indigenous people, women, youth, and the civil society uh, who gave their input uh, in the African popular consultation. And I'll mention the four issues that came up. One is the effects of COVID-19. The second one is the geopolitical and economic factors. The third is corporate, corporate resource grabbing and uh, the expanding extractivism. And the fourth is uh, dependence on the food imports. So on the uh, effects of COVID-19, uh, of course, the global food uh, supply chains were affected and these revealed uh, the limits in the social and environmental and also uh, economic factors that have been mentioned. Uh, on the geopolitical and uh, economic issues, um, Africa has been uh, a prime victim of existing global inequalities. Um, a subordinated economic power in the world scene, of course, which limits the voice uh, of the African people in political decision making. And this has directly affected the continent and its nations and the extremely uneven distribution of costs and the benefits uh, which have arisen from the exploitation of natural uh, resources uh, of the African people. And this has, affect, has been affected by the structural inequalities as well, which have been introduced uh, from the time of colonialism and reinforced by uh, neoliberal policies. The second, the other issue was uh, the corporate response, the corporate resource grabbing and the expanding extract extractivism, and uh, multi which has multiple armed conflicts have been spurred on by the acceleration of global armament and markets, and the conditions have. Uh, justify the frustration and the despair of the youth in many countries and regions, which have greeted ground uh, for the engagement in dangerous and illicit routes for survival. Women are particularly affected and their burden is compounded by gender-based violence and inequalities. And recently, uh, we were just seeing that uh, the 16 days uh, to speak against gender-based violence for women. This is extremely important in the region of Africa because of the inequalities and cultural differences that exist for women who actually make the bulk uh, of the people who produce food, but also for the young people who make up the largest population of uh, the people in the region of Africa. The other issue is the dependence on uh, food imports. And um, faced with the multiple food crisis, African governments are calling uh, for the breaking of dependency of food imports. But uh, most of them are uh, implementing at the same time an agenda of uh, modernizing African agriculture by concentrating their investment in specialized uh, export-oriented commodities uh, based on corporate seeds and technologies, which destroy our continent's capacities and possibilities to effectively limit food dependency. And I could also see in the chat, we had uh, input from Yonida Odongo, who speaks about the increased biotech. And for example, in Kenya, we have the lifting of, of the ban on on the GMOs, which is something that is seen across Africa. 
also the overindulgence of industrial agriculture vis-a-vis -vis, uh, agroecology. And even when policy frameworks promoting agroecological uh, farming and territorial food systems have been adopted uh, with the participation of producer organi uh, organizations, um, they have not been uh, implemented. So the African popular consultation had a couple of demands. I'll mention three of them. One is the value of indigenous knowledge, uh, plants and people, because this will help uh, to support uh, the agricultural sector. The second one is the dedication of 10% of the national budget to the agricultural sector, which are results to, uh, which resulted from the Maputo commitment. Well, and had, um, finishing, the third would be the development of coherent and inclusive cross-sectional food strategies, which link the urban and rural areas. So the Africa Popular Consultation ends by urging um, the African government and and the civil society to work together to obtain that the CFS develops a globally coordinated response to the food crisis. I'll end with a quote that says, we have no choice but to cooperate multilaterally, to listen to our people and to respond to our people. And that the voice of people is the voice of God. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sefu, for also connecting with the comments on the chat uh, from Leonida. Uh, I see also Alex Ifundo uh, has asked for uh, recommendations to um, address the inequalities affecting indigenous peoples and local communities. Um, maybe I would encourage the CSIPM secretariat to put the link of the African Declaration where you will find also these recommendations that came out uh, of the African Regional uh, Popular Consultation. Um, now, um, moving on with the agenda, um, Hala um, Barakat will be uh, speaking uh, from uh, the MENA region. Uh, Hala Barakat uh, is a part of um, HIC. Uh, she's connecting from Egypt, and she's also a co-coordinator of the CSIPM Global Food Governance Working Group together with Andre. Uh, so, Hala, um, over to you, please. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Maggie. Thank you so, so much. I hope everyone can hear me well. Um, I'm presenting today uh, the, uh, the update from the Middle East and North Africa region. Uh, in the absence of popular consultations, we have, um, together with Heather Ig, also from HIC, we've uh, done uh, some research and uh, did this article. So this is like a summary of this article. I go immediately into the, um, the, uh, the subject. Uh, and I, I think I had uh, asked to, to share a map, so which I'm going to get to and keep during the presentation. So just to make, make a point that the impact of the pandemic and the war in Ukraine have uncovered the fragility of the food security in the MENA region. But the effect of this multi-layered food crisis is more pronounced for the most vulnerable. The most vulnerable are the refugees and those living in areas of protracted conflicts and under occupation, and women, particularly rural women, although the urban female population is not much better off, particularly in crowded, polluted, and conflict-ridden cities. So any solutions for the food crisis in the region must take into account these two major aspects, conflicts and gender inequalities. If we can see the map. The map is from 2021 and it shows the percentage of population currently food insecure. Clearly, <clears throat> the largest percentage is in Syria and in Yemen. The situation in 2022 is worse but also Lebanon and Palestine are suffering. From a conflict's perspective, there are many countries in the MENA region, conflict, the displacement, the occupation, the sanctions and the war, they have been the biggest barrier to achieving food sovereignty and food security for many years. Conflict is the biggest driver for hunger. Now 60% of the world's hungry, they live in areas afflicted by war and violence. 
And in the MENA regions, many of these conflicts are even suffering from interference from other countries, which lead to destabilization, exacerbating and prolonging these conflicts. Yemen. Yemen has been experiencing famine conditions in parts of the country since 2017. The number of people in need of food assistance increased from 17 to 19 million since 2019. In 2022, the World Food Program cut emergency food rations to Yemen due to disruptions of wheat from Russia and Ukraine and the increased costs associated with this. Syria. In 2022, up from 50%, now 60% of the people in Syria, 12 million people are food insecure. In Gaza, Palestinians face two full-scale military attacks by Israel in May 2021 and August 2022. These attacks damage and destroyed land, crops, greenhouses, and infrastructure. This is already a very vulnerable uh, food system in Palestine caused by nearly 75 years of Israeli colonization and land theft. In 2021, an EU court struck down the trade and fisheries deal between the EU and Morocco because the deal was agreed without the consent of the indigenous people of the Western Sahara. Yet Spain chose to ignore the court's decision. And in 2019, Morocco exported 400 34 million euro worth of fish, tomatoes, and melons to Europe from Western Sahara. The challenges facing, faced by conflict-afflicted countries in the MENA region include, but are not limited to, the lack of political will to end the conflicts. Also that the states in general show lack of interest in ensuring that the global food system functions in a way to reduce the vulnerability of communities experiencing conflict, occupation and war. And add to this, there is also lack of funds. So conflicts in the middle, in the MENA regions are chron chronically underfunded by the international community. The solutions needed, many of them are actually outlined in the CFS framework for action for food security and nutrition in protracted crises, FFA and the CSIPM report on monitoring the use and application of the FFA, where it is clear that, that states should respect extraterritorial obligations by halting third country interference in conflicts, including donation and sale of arms, which serve, of course, to imbalance and prolong the conflicts. But also states include, must include affected communities, especially small scale food producers in designing implementing and monitoring policies and actions of humanitarian and development interventions. They must act on the drivers for protracted conflict by exerting pressure on aggressors and occupying powers and end food price speculation and support local food production. From a gender perspective, there are specific issues related to the gender gap in the MENA region that makes the situation more dire than in other regions. And because of that, women are more likely to be food insecure and they have poorer perce perceived health and well-being. One very important point is women's land rights in rural areas. So while agriculture is the main source of livelihood in many, in many countries, in many of them, millions of females working on agricultural land, they are mostly unpaid labor on family lands or hired labor on lands other than their own because women in the MENA region own only 5% of the agricultural land. They represent more than 40% of the agricultural workers. Land ownership not only secures income and food and shelter, but also access to loan and other financial benefits. Here, I want to make it very clear that land rights for females are supported by the Islamic principles, the main, the main religion in the region and even the state laws in most of the countries. But in practice, female land ownership is limited and precarious due to deep-seated societal norms, illiteracy, and unawareness of rights, all of which lead to loss of land or property to their male relatives. The second important point 
is the sexual and gender-based violence. So women and girls in rural and urban settings are subject to various forms of sexual and gender-based violence, sometimes very dangerous and life-threatening. So it is estimated that worldwide, maybe 30% of the women and girls are subjected to some kind of SGBV, while in the MENA region, the rate reaches 90%. And hunger is a major cause for SGBV. The situation is amplified by what happened during the pandemic and the war. And then we can see the rise in prevalent incidents and different forms of SGBV, including levels of intimate partner violence, sexual violence, harassment, exploitation, abuse, and child marriage. The violence prevents women also from accessing education and workplaces, working on farms, accessing markets, using public transport, and feeling safe in public spaces. It hinders, hinders their livelihoods and their sources of income, leading to more poverty and food insecurity. Then there is a situation of migrants and refugees in the region. And migrants and refugees, especially women, they suffer from various forms of discrimination. And many of them resort to working as houseworkers. These houseworkers are employed to kick and clean and cook, etc. And there is an estimated of 1.6 million refugee domestic workers in the richer part of the MENA region. Their living and working conditions are less than optimal, making them vulnerable to their employers. And putting houseworkers, particularly migrants and refugees, in a state of deprivation and insecurity on many levels, including and particularly in cases of crisis. And finally, another point that's very important, the social protection. Rural, rural, as well as urban women in the MENA region, they have difficulty accessing services such as health services, social protection, due to economic practices and social norms. The social coverage rates of women are often under half of those of women, of men, because women are mostly part of the informal economy. They work as domestic workers, self-employed or housewives. And with the rising poverty, the gender gap, gap is increasing, as also is the need for social protection to provide basic needs, food, and avoid the staggering food incident. So we have uh, put together some recommendations. Quickly, I'll go through them. There is a need to enforce the women's inheritance rights. And this needs to be done in collaboration with religious leaders, spiritual leaders, and community patterns. There is a need to create gender knowledge and share them. There is a need to protect citizens' rights to secure land. And there is a need to consult and involve women in development and management of initiatives. There is a need to implement gender-adapted financial solutions and extension services and improve women's ability to make use of the services and solutions. There is a need to enhance women's access to decent employment. And in particular, in this region, there is a need to regulate the conditions of houseworkers. And finally, there is a suggestion to expand the cash transfer programs and increase semi-cash allowances under the food subsidy program in the region and make these payable to women to better target the poorest housewives. I will skip the conclusion and thank you so much, Maggie, for giving me the time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hala. And um, we had a, a quite longer presentation for the MENA region because this wasn't done before. So thanks again so much, Hala and Heather, for uh, presenting uh, this uh, important input and particularly emphasizing you know, the, the gender perspective and how issues such as gender, sexual and gender-based violence and uh, intersecting forms of discrimination cannot be separated uh, from uh, addressing you know, the, the current food crisis that uh, we are facing. Um,
I see that uh, Marion has kindly uh, pasted on the chat the declaration from the African region. Uh, and we have also shared um, by the request of the Subsecretary of Agriculture uh, in Mexico his declaration uh, during uh, the plenary in October. Uh, we don't have uh, much time for discussions, so please uh, put your comments and questions in the chat. Uh, and now I will give the moderation over uh, back to Manoj, actually. So, Manoj, please. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Magdalena. I'm really sorry that we are not having more time for discussions. It's a very rich fair, and I think, uh, you know, what we will ensure is that also send you all the links to these documents and then I really hope that you will take time and study them because it is so rich and so intense. Um, now we, we go into the conclusions and we have very two very important uh, contributions. Uh, one is from Victor Suarez, uh, who is the Vice Minister of Food Self-Sufficiency of Mexico. He's an ag agronomist and specialized in agricultural uh, uh, economics. Uh, as, as a federal deputy, he promoted the law on planning for food and nutritional sovereignty and security, uh, the, the law on protection and improvement of Mexican seeds, and the initiative for the creation of Cedresa, among others. Of course, you know, he's, uh, he's a very, very uh, significant uh, uh, individual for people, people's movements, because his vast experience for more than 40 years as a peasant organizer, as a public administrator and legislator and, and a forger of social movements, you know, places him in a very important position among uh, policymakers. Uh, I over to you, Victor, for your insights. Muchísimas gracias. Eh. En primer lugar, agradezco muchísimo la invitación del de Consejo Mundial de Iglesias y del Mecanismo de la Sociedad Civil y de los Pueblos Indígenas para este importante sem seminario. Y quiero saludar también, en primer lugar, a mi amigo, el presidente del Consejo de Seguridad Alimentaria Mundial, Gabriel Ferrero, y también pues, al actual coordinador del Mecanismo de la Sociedad Civil, Hernán, Hernando Salcedo, y también pues a Martín, quien ha dejado recientemente la coordinación de tan importante mecanismo. Comparto plenamente los diagnósticos que se han presentado en, este, en esta conferencia y solamente quisiera enfatizar que es el momento de, de, de poner eh, prioridad a las acciones orientadas a la transformación del sistema alimentario global. No es posible continuar con la inercia y medidas cosméticas a las recurrentes crisis alimentarias que está experimentando el planeta. Eh, y es posible que de no hacerlo, pues año con año crecerá la inseguridad alimentaria la malnutrición, el hambre y la violación sistemática a los derechos humanos de la mayoría de los pueblos del mundo. Por eso a mí me parece muy importante ahora, en primer lugar, en, en vista de la presente crisis alimentaria eh, disparada o eh, promovida eh, por la crisis en Ucrania, y, y en otros conflictos bélicos en el mundo, me parece muy importante que hoy se levante en primer lugar una campaña mundial por la paz y por la eliminación de las sanciones y de los bloqueos económicos unilaterales que en diversas partes del mundo se están presentando desde hace muchos años y ahora recientemente en, en Ucrania. Mientras no trabajemos en este tema, la inflación alimentaria y la inseguridad de los suministros de alimentos y de fertilizantes en el mundo continuará al mismo tiempo que crecen las utilidades de las grandes empresas eh, agroalimentarias que concentran la mayor parte 
del flujo comercial, de la producción de alimentos y la producción de fertilizantes y otros agroquímicos. Y me parece que, parece que estamos experimentando una cierta normalización de la guerra y de sus consecuencias y de muchos otros conflictos en el mundo. Y si no somos capaces de levantar una acción global para frenar la guerra y, y las invasiones y las, eh, los bloqueos económicos y las sanciones que afectan a la seguridad alimentaria mundial y los derechos de los pueblos, pues vamos a seguir hablando y no vamos a, 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 a resolver ni a contribuir a mm, revertir esta situación que a todos nos eh, preocupa. Esa es la, la primera consideración que yo quiero hacer. La segunda consideración es que en este marco de crisis terminal del modelo neoliberal de alimentación y comercio, eh, pone en el centro... El, la, en la agenda de cada país el tema de la soberanía alimentaria y la autosuficiencia alimentaria. No podemos, es el momento de revertir el modelo fracasado de dependencia alimentaria. Cada país, cada región, cada localidad debe producir sus propios alimentos de conformidad con sus culturas agrícolas y alimentarias y romper con este modelo eh, imperial que se impuso bajo los modelos neoliberales. Autosuficiencia alimentaria, soberanía alimentaria, poniendo en el centro el potencial productivo de los campesinos y campesinas con transición agroecológica y revalorización de las dietas locales. En primer lugar, producir para comer. Esa es una... Eh, prioridad para enfrentar la actual crisis global de alimentos. En este sentido, es eh, prioridad, es vital reorientar los presupuestos nacionales hacia eh, apoyos, subsidios directos a la pequeña producción, la inversión pública para eh, semillas, fertilizantes sintéticos y orgánicos, y también para proveer un sistema de asistencia técnico, técnica a ras de tierra. Es, es muy importante dejar de eh, este, para, este, este paradigma neoliberal de que los campesinos no son productivos y que solamente la agricultura comercial agroexportadora es eh, motivo de los apoyos públicos. Por otro lado, es importante desde mi punto de vista... Eh, promover una alianza de gobiernos y, mo y movimientos progresistas para impulsar los cambios regionales y después a nivel global en el sistema alimentario internacional. Particularmente hablo de América Latina y el Caribe que pues, está experimentando una, un ascenso de los gobiernos progresistas con los tropiezos que hemos este, visto recientemente en el Perú pero tenemos eh, gobiernos como eh, Colombia, como eh, Brasil, con la llegada de Lula eh, en los próximos días, y pues eh, Argentina, Bolivia, Chile, eh, Venezuela, Cuba, me México, etc. Entonces necesitamos que de esos gobiernos y movimientos progresistas se articulen para impulsar políticas regionales y también globales para la transformación de los sistemas alimentarios globales. Eh, finalmente, es importante poner en el centro la reforma eh, al marco global de los sistemas alimentarios internacionales. No podemos seguir permitiendo el conflicto de intereses en los órganos, en los organismos eh, de las Naciones Unidas. Hay una creciente intervención inapropiada de las empresas transnacionales en los organismos de las Naciones Unidas, incluyendo a la FAO. Es importante generar un, un marco de, de, de regulación a la influencia de las transnacionales y de las grandes fundaciones. Es importante regular la especulación financiera en los mercados de alimentos y, el uso, y en el uso de alimentos para la producción de energías limpias, entre comillas. Y finalmente, nosotros hemos propuesto a, a través de nuestro presidente Andrés Manuel López Obrador en las Naciones Unidas 
la creación de un fondo eh, global de emergencia para combatir a la pobreza, para combatir la inseguridad alimentaria, con contribuciones de los eh, países de G20, con contribuciones de los eh, impuestos a las megacorporaciones alimentarias y eh, farmacéuticas y energéticas, y algunas contribuciones voluntarias de, los, de las mayores riquezas del mundo. Y finalmente decirles que en México se está promoviendo la realización de un seminario internacional para finales de octubre del 2023 sobre agroecología y autosuficiencia alimentaria en un mundo multipolar que queremos proponer la creación del Consejo de Seguridad Alimentaria Mundial, del Mecanismo de la Sociedad Civil y, por supuesto, también al Consejo Mundial de Iglesias para eh, tratar de encontrarnos e ir generando un consenso y una, un conjunto de alianzas de gobiernos y movimientos progresistas desde abajo. Es lo que quisiera yo compartir con ustedes y ponemos a disposición pues la experiencia y, y la, la fuerza de, de, de nuestro gobierno, que es un gobierno progresista que combate el neoliberalismo y respeta la soberanía de los pueblos y en un marco también de cooperación para el desarrollo. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, uh, Victor Suárez, and for the inspiring input, and it gives us hope. Uh, and thank you, thank you so much. I, uh, I, I, we have reached the the top of the hour. Uh, I request your indulgence that we give space for the last word, uh, and especially to the interpreters. Thank you so much for your help. Please uh, bear with us for one more input, and this is important because we have uh, with us. Uh, Gabriel Ferrero, uh, who is currently the, the chair of the Committee for Food Security. He is currently serving as ambassador at large for global food security at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, European Union and, Corp and Corporation of the Government of Spain. Uh, formerly, uh, he was the Director General for Sustainable Development Policies from 2018 to 2021, when he uh, during the responsibility, that period, he was the lead order, author and the strategist for the 2030 Agenda and Implementation Action Plan of Spain. And, uh, and, and you know, has done very important role even for Spain's work uh, uh, and strategy to face the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And before that, he was serving as the, uh, the in the executive office of the United Nations Secretary General from 2011 to 2017, uh, including as a coordinator for UN Secretary General's high level task force on the global food security and as a team leader for the UN Secretary General's special uh, representative for food and nutrition security. So, you know, we have a very, very important uh, ally and, and, and we, we really see you, sir, as, as a great, uh, important role in this very important juncture. Uh, over to you, Gabriel. Thank you very much uh, indeed, Manoj, and uh, I will speak in Spanish uh, thanks to your kind uh, availability of interpretation. Es un enorme placer estar aquí. Y estoy enormemente agradecido al Consejo Mundial de las Iglesias y al Mecanismo de la Sociedad Civil por la invitación eh, que me, me habéis transmitido para unirme a, esta, a este seminario y a esta reflexión. Eh, no hay mucho tiempo para, para poder concluir por mi parte, eh, pero sí quería, como presidente también del comité, decirles en primer lugar que he sentido como este es un evento también del Comité de Seguridad Alimentaria, porque el Mecanismo de la Sociedad Civil es una de las partes integrantes del Comité de Seguridad Alimentaria. Me ha agradado enormemente ver muchos países, eh, miembros, muchos participantes eh, del, del Comité de Seguridad Alimentaria estar hoy también en, esta, en este video seminario. Queridos amigas, queridos eh, colegas, eh, escuchar la voz de los pobres es escuchar la voz de Dios. Eso, esa frase es de uno de mis maestros eh, de la teología de la liberación en Latinoamérica. Y creo que eh, esa frase puede también inspirar todo lo que hemos estado escuchando hoy. Hemos estado escuchando la voz de las, de las, a través de las organizaciones de todas aquellas personas que sufren discriminación, sufren exclusión, 
eh, y sufre en primer lugar los efectos, primero de una pandemia y segundo de una crisis de múltiples caras que está empobreciendo eh, y que está haciendo a muchas personas volver a, atrás en su sufrimiento de carencias, de privaciones, está incrementando las desigualdades y dificultando eh, el, 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 el avance en el derecho a la alimentación. Y creo que escuchar la voz eh, marca una enorme diferencia eh, respecto a escuchar solo a través de los delegados de los países. Y creo que eso es un enorme valor eh, de, de aprendo hoy, que me reafirma hoy después de haberles escuchado. Creo que estamos ante una amenaza eh, probablemente eh, como nunca ha sido al derecho a la alimentación y al derecho humano en general, eh, en, desde décadas. Primero con esta primera ola en cuanto al derecho a la alimentación de dificultad de acceso a los alimentos por tan mitos millones de personas en el mundo. Y tenemos que evitar a toda costa una segunda ola que puede ser la falta de, incluso de disponibilidad de alimentos y no solo de, de, de imposibilidad de acceso a los mismos. Quería, mi segunda reflexión, que quería compartir mi segunda reflexión acerca de qué coordinación se necesita para responder a una situación como esta. Coordinación, y creo que entendemos que al hablar de coordinación, hablamos en realidad de respuestas mejor coordinadas y más enérgicas. Pues son múltiples las respuestas, son múltiples y a múltiples niveles. Se necesitan respuestas a nivel nacional, a nivel regional, a nivel eh, global, y lo hemos escuchado de todos los panelistas y de todas las panelistas eh, hoy. ¿Qué ingredientes a todos los niveles, para mí, eh, se necesitan? En primer lugar, esas respuestas mejor coordinadas y más enérgicas se necesitan de manera que integren los sectores, que integren los diferentes temas que habitualmente se abordan por separado, que superen los... Los, las divisiones entre ministerios, entre disciplinas, entre organizaciones, entre líneas presupuestarias, entre actores. Por lo tanto, una respuesta integrada. Y para mí esa respuesta integrada lo habéis detallado desde la base, desde los movimientos de base y desde las comunidades, pero también desde eh, el coordinador del grupo de respuesta de las Naciones Unidas a la crisis global. Pasan por asegurar la respuesta humanitaria pasan por la protección social, eh, con, especialmente orientada a la nutrición, pero también a la capacidad de adquisición o de, de afrontar, mejor dicho, ese, esa crisis de coste de la vida. Protección social, pero también el apoyo a, los, a la pequeña y al pequeño y mediano eh, productor, a la, a la agricultura familiar, a los, a, a los trabajadores en los sistemas alimentarios. Ellos son quienes tienen la clave, además de reconstruir unos sistemas alimentarios en el futuro que sean inclusivos y sostenibles. Por supuesto, significa asegurar el acceso a inputs, incluyendo fertilizantes a muy corto plazo. Por supuesto que sí, pero siempre con la visión de una transformación hacia un uso eficiente y hacia modelos eh, respetuosos con las personas y con el planeta. Hace falta recursos públicos, financiación pública suficiente para poder hacer frente al apoyo de protección social y el apoyo a la producción a pequeña escala. Hace falta rebalancear las cadenas de valor de manera que los mercados locales y territoriales y nacionales provean de la resiliencia a un sistema demasiado orientado al, eh, a las cadenas de valor internacionales. Y finalmente, hace falta unas respuestas que contemplen la, es, las fallas estructurales de unos sistemas alimentarios que por décadas no han conseguido abordar o alcanzar el derecho a la alimentación ni progresar en el derecho a la alimentación sin una degradación importante de nuestro planeta. El segundo elemento, además del enfoque integrado de todos los elementos que hacen falta, es la necesidad de que existan plataformas de participación, plataformas participativas, donde los gobiernos y la sociedad civil y el sector privado y la academia dialoguen, pacten y se definan políticas públicas por quien tiene que definirlas, que son quienes tienen la responsabilidad, los gobiernos, que hayan sido informadas e influidas decisivamente por las, por las voces 
de aquellas personas, aquellos grupos que más sufren de la crisis eh, y, que, y que casi siempre tienen menos voz eh, o menos influencia. En tercer lugar, hace falta una acción coordinada también por la parte de la comunidad internacional, del sistema de las Naciones Unidas, de las instituciones financieras internacionales, etc. Estas tres ingredientes, integración, plataformas participativas y coordinación del sistema internacional, a mi modo de ver, tienen que darse en todos los niveles, desde el nacional hasta el regional y hasta el local, con diferentes formas. A nivel global, la plataforma la está proveyendo el Comité de Seguridad Alimentaria, porque es la única plataforma a nivel mundial que junta a los gobiernos con la sociedad civil y los pueblos indígenas, también con el sector privado, con la academia y con todo el sistema de las Naciones Unidas. No hay otra plataforma igual en toda, a toda en la escala global. También a nivel global, el, el grupo de respuesta a la crisis del secretario general, que hoy ha representado el doctor David Navarro, está asegurando esa respuesta coordinada por parte de todo el sistema de las Naciones Unidas, agencias, programas, eh, fondos, e intentando también atraer al sistema de financiación financiero internacional, eh, Banco Mundial, eh, etcétera, a converger, a acercarse hacia una mejor respuesta coordinada. El Comité de Seguridad Alimentaria Mundial, además, conecta los esfuerzos de los países, de los gobiernos, ese primer nivel a nivel del país, con el grupo de respuesta a la crisis a nivel de las Naciones Unidas eh, y el trabajo, los trabajos que está desarrollando, junto con todas las partes interesadas. El Comité de Seguridad Alimentaria Mundial ha demostrado durante 10 años que ha conseguido que todos los países acuerden recomendaciones y provisiones de políticas sustantivas y sustanciales en cada uno de los elementos que acabamos de mencionar como necesarios para responder a la crisis. Es, por lo tanto, un comité que ya ha demostrado que puede proveer, acordar recomendaciones respecto a estos temas. Lo que puede ofrecer el Comité de Seguridad Alimentaria Mundial, y espero que así lo haga, es servir ese rol de plataforma de manera que las decisiones que tomarán cada uno de los gobiernos, cada una de las instituciones financieras internacionales a sus diferentes niveles, nivel nacional, regional o global, estén también debatidas a nivel internacional. Se conozcan y sean transparentes. Se puedan ver influidas por el diálogo abierto con eh, el mecanismo de la sociedad civil o el sector privado y, por lo tanto, informado también por las voces desde abajo, que es lo que este evento hoy, este seminario hoy, nos ha demostrado. Y ese es mi compromiso, eh, queridos amigas y queridos eh, amigos, hacer que el Comité provea esa plataforma para que esto sea así. Para que esa coordinación, esas coordinaciones, porque son múltiples, esas múltiples respuestas y a todos los niveles se vean, sean más armónicas, más decididas, más incisivas y mejor dotadas. De manera que cada uno en su territorio, en su lugar, en su comunidad, tenga una mayor claridad y una mayor, un mayor impulso a sus esfuerzos. Y termino aquí nuevamente agradeciéndoles eh, por esta oportunidad eh, y por, sobre todo por la oportunidad de aprender, de escucharles y de eh, modificar mis propios pensamientos y reflexiones a través de escuchar las voces desde la base. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you very much, uh, Gabriel, for your commitment and for your call to all of us to organize, coordinate, uh, and respond, and to rebuild bottom up and 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 challenging for for all to you know for action at all levels and hold those in power responsible uh, and accountable. Thank you so much. I I, I hand over to Andre Lutzi, the, uh, the the coordinator of the CSIPM Global Food Governance Working Group, to uh, give us uh, closing remarks. Muchísimas gracias, Menor, a todos que todas que participaron en este proceso muy largo. Y llegamos a este punto de reemplazamiento de la plenaria, el día 19 de diciembre. Deseamos que todos los representantes de los Estados miembros estén comprometidos con las respuestas coordinadas necesarias. Nosotros ponemos en la mesa una propuesta muy factible práctica, objetiva, basada jurídicamente en el documento de reforma del CCA para valorizar y garantizar que el CCA sea ese espacio más inclusivo. Como vimos en las distintas ponencias, tenemos un sentido de urgencia 
para garantizar la paz, garantizar el derecho humano a la alimentación. Los documentos más antiguos ya nos decían que la paz es fruto de la justicia. Y ahora, en el tiempo presente, vemos que necesitamos trabajar de una manera articulada la justicia social, la justicia climática y ambiental y la, justi la justicia alimentaria. Así que debemos poner nuestras energías con este sentido de urgencia a llegar a un término bueno en 19 de diciembre y garantizar esta respuesta coordinada de las distintas eh, respuestas que debemos tener. Una perspectiva de un Jesús Cristo demasiadamente humano había dicho que él, como revolucionario, ha hecho un convencimiento para que las personas en su comunidad de otrora ponen en la playa todos los pescados que tenían a más. Y así todas las personas pudieron tener la abundancia y se alimentar adecuadamente. Así que Jesús Cristo, en este espacio de un encuentro ecuménico con apoyo del Consejo de las Iglesias, podemos tener su propio mensaje de Jesús Cristo para que tengamos un sentido de justicia verdadera por la paz, por reforma agraria, por soberanía alimentaria, por los derechos humanos. Y por fin, en nuestro diagrama presentamos cómo puede ser esta coordinación. Queremos que todos y todas puedan mirar nuestro informe donde está nuestra propuesta. Y también, como parte de nuestra movilización, ustedes hacen política, nosotros pasamos hambre, presentamos una orientación política, cómo pueden los distintos estados miembros se comprometer a esta respuesta. Así que vamos juntos y juntas, una vez más, a la plenaria para tener unas respuestas satisfactorias a tantos retos directos humanos y a los dilemas alimentarios. Digamos. Muchísimas gracias, gracias a los intérpretes y las intérpretes por su trabajo tan importante a este proceso inclusivo. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, André. Thank you so much for, 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 for sitting through and for all this. But just to say, you know, uh, the famous uh, uh, African-American philosopher Cornel West said, justice is what love looks like in public. If there is no justice, there is no love. Love and justice are together. So faith communities are one with civil society in the struggle. Let us prepare and let us go forth uh, with courage and hope. Thank you very much and uh, all the best uh, for all uh, the CFS. Thank you for participating. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you for, for the interpreters and thank all the resource persons. Thank you so much, Manoj.